Welcome to Keys of the Kingdom. I'm Brother Gregory, and we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a spiritual place, but it's also a physical place because it is a kingdom of God at hand. It's for the living. It's not just for the dead. It's not for just when after you die you're going to go to some uh, pie-in-the-sky retirement community where you're going to be happy and happy and happy forever and ever and ever. That's not what the kingdom of God was about. That's, Jesus almost mentioned nothing about that throughout his uh, campaign as king of Judea, which is really what he was. He came to be the king of Judea, but not to be the king like a lot of people wanted to think. A lot of people wanted to be a ruler and throw out the Romans and, you know, make everything good again. And the reality is you can't make things good again unless the people are good again. (laughs) So that's why Jesus came to call you to repentance. John the Baptist came to call you to repentance, and repentance means thinking a different way. And unfortunately, a lot of people today that think they're Christians are thinking a way that is contrary to Christ, and it's creating conflict in the world, and the world is coming into conflict with real Christians. Uh, There are lots of people who don't really know what Christianity is about, and yet they think they're Christians, and so we're going to look at some things that are going on in the world so that you can see if you're of the spirit of the world or of the spirit of Christ because those two spirits are not compatible because the spirit of the world is not one who gives life but takes life away it's not one who sets you free but brings you into bondage but the spirit of Christ sets you free and one of the things that sets you free is forgiveness I've seen you know uh and I think I will continue to see in the recent uh, past as well as in the fu- uh, near future, we will uh, uncover a certain amount of the fact that people are often trying to fight what they consider to be the enemy, and uh, they are not doing it from a point of view of forgiveness. They are trying to resist evil. They are trying to fight against evil. And the way to fight against evil is to... Seek the good. Seek the righteousness in everything, in every aspect of your life. That's the way you fight evil. You don't fight evil by pitting yourself against evil itself. So if someone is uh, harassing you, poking at you, making trouble, uh, trying to control or manipulate you, you don't get angry at them. If you do get angry, if you do get upset, you do get resentful, then you are falling pray to the evil you don't get rid of darkness by cursing it you get rid of darkness by turning on the light by opening up your eyes and that's that's a very important tactic in fighting evil today in the world and there's a lot of it moving around in the world i mean hell is emptying out and all the demons are here but anyway the topic i've I've told some people um mentioned on Facebook uh, because that's where I first posted uh, recent news there was uh, a uh, uh, battle in subcommittees as we talked last uh, week that uh, uh, about a new bill coming up HB 3063 which is uh, in Oregon and it's passed in Oregon uh, and it hasn't passed the Senate yet but it's making this progress through committees and subcommittees. And uh, it is considered, and I quote here, the most restrictive legislation to pass in any state ever. And it has to do with mandatory vaccinations. Uh, You know, just the idea that it's okay to force everybody to receive any kind of medical treatment should be just absolutely abhorrent or absurd and devoid of thinking. But people think, oh, wait, we have to do it. We're going to take a look at why you don't have to do it, why it's a bad idea, and we're going to just look at the facts, look at statistics, and let you make your own choices. And there's a real element fighting against this information, which is available. Actually, there's a lot more information available, but it, the the powers that be are keeping it a secret They won't let it out. They won't let it be examined. And uh, 
people who are called anti-vaxxers, and a lot of the people that I've been listening to are not anti-vaxxers, but they're anti-mandatory vaccination, and they have some very good reason. These are these are doctors. Uh, these are these are people who have uh, looked into it in great depth, have personal knowledge of it. Uh, many of them administer vaccines on a regular basis, but they know that there are certain elements of the population that are vulnerable, more vulnerable to vaccine side effects than other members of society. They would be put in uh, grave danger if you had mandatory vaccinations, and there are repercussions to ban- mandatory vaccinations to everyone, even those people who get vaccinations. And we'll we'll take a look at some of that before we're done uh, This is really a part of our salvation series, so we're really looking at this vaccination thing in order to get a perspective on what salvation really is. Because Christ came that you might be saved, and I'm afraid that, and this is what Christ said, that there's going to be a lot of people who think they're saved, think they're following Christ, and are actually workers of iniquity. And it's very important for us to understand how to tell that apart, to find out if we are deluded, we're under one of those strong delusions that we see the Bible talking about where we think we're saved and we're actually workers of iniquity and Christ will say, get ye from me because you're workers of iniquity. How do you know if you're a worker of iniquity? You're, you're not going to know by going to a lot of churches today because a lot of the churches today are really cults and uh, they are a part of what would be called the Roman imperial cult back in the days of Jesus Christ. They would actually be fighting against Jesus Christ but there is a false gospel, which we were told would would crop up everywhere, that is out there saying that if you believe this, this, and this, and this, then you're saved. And it's not true. And they, they present kind of viable arguments that you are saved if you believe this, this, and this, and this. But if you really study the scriptures instead of depend upon pastors and, uh, you know, the what the Bible would call brutish pastors, uh, for your understanding of the Bible, you won't get it. And you may not get some of the things we're going to tell you about vaccinations and the law, et cetera, et cetera, and how the systems of the world work and how they work against Christ and how they can actually work for Christ if Christ is in you. And uh, so anyway, uh, the bill, like I said, that was passed uh, by a committee uh, with an amendment which was Amendment 13, that, that, for you numerologists out there, that, that may be a sign in itself, but we're going to actually take a look at some of the amendment, what it means, as well as some of the other things that are coming about in the bill and why this is considered the most restrictive legislation to pass in any state ever. Now, Rome had universal health care for a while. They had lots of laws that were coming up, and that was pre- predicting their fall that they would they would eventually head towards um, total totalitarian dictatorship. 150 years before Christ, this was pointed out. You know, 100 years before the first emperor of Rome, there were very astute people that were telling people the courses that they were choosing to take in society, individually, in society, was going to alter society and bring about despotism and eventually destruction. And they were 100% right, because that's what eventually happened. And Christ came during the midst of that process. John the Baptist was out there preaching against the use of force to provide the welfare of society. That was the essential element of uh, of John the Baptist's preaching, that you were to take care of one another through charity, not through force. Today, it is commonly accepted that, yeah, that's the way you take care of people, is you force them to contribute, you borrow money against the future of your children. And, of course, Proverbs tells you, no, that's not the way to do it. Uh, The Old Testament tells you, no, that's not the way to do it. Jeremiah tells you, that's not the way to do it. John the Baptist told you, Jesus told you, Peter told you, Paul told you, John told you that you, you cannot take care of the needy through force. You need to take care of the needy through what was called pure religion, which was a religion of charity. Because if you will not depend upon charity, you will 
become, you will re-enter the bondage of Egypt. You will uh, go back in, away from the salvation of Christ in this world and the next. You, you will actually, the Bible tells us, you will actually be blinded so you cannot see the truth. Now, a lot of people don't see the truth because nobody's ever told them. And so that's what we're going to try to do is tell you a little bit about the truth. And eventually we're going to touch on the long-range repercussions of seeing the truth and denying the truth. Because if you deny the truth about one aspect of reality, the, the reality around you, if you deny some of that reality, it will darken your eyes and you will not see other things that you need to see other things that may bring destruction to you, your family, your society. If you, The more you're not willing to see about yourself, the more vulnerable you are to the elements of destruction. Because ultimately this battle between good and evil, light and darkness, life and death, one, those that are moving towards death are doing things that, you know, like the, they'll... Uh, go and shoot up a bunch of people or kill a bunch of people and then they'll kill themselves. That's a sign that they're, they are have fallen prey to the spirit of destruction. And other people who sacrifice their life and... Uh, so you, you have an element in the world that somebody was bringing up, you know, that people are armed, uh, people have guns in America to defend themselves against tyranny. Most of the people who have arms in America to defend themselves against tyranny are closer to the tyrant than to Christ. And they may think they're Christians, but they're actually closer to the tyrant than to Christ. Now, there are some people who are armed and are closer to Christ. But uh, Christians were always in the minority in Rome. There were going to be uh, a minority in Babylon, going to be a minority in you know, Babylon the Great, but they are, you know, kind of like the uh, Fellowship of the Ring. They they will be victorious, even though they're in the minority. But you, I, I, I want you to be over there on the Christian side and not on the fake Christian side. So anyway, so we're going to take a look at this item 13 in the amendment just to see what spirits are writing these things. <laughs> and are you a part of those spirits? And then... Then we're going to take a look at why this is really such a bad idea, because if you think mandatory vaccines are good and that they will protect you and uh, provide for the greater good, you are mistaken. And we're going to show you why you're mistaken. And uh, if you're courageous enough and humble enough to take a look at the facts, which are all around you in lots of different forms, then maybe you can wake up to other facts about salvation that you have not been willing or not been able or not had the opportunity to see. Now, everybody's coming from a little bit different place, but, you know, where you're at spiritually is not always obvious by going into your modern church. Because the modern church, for the most part, we have articles up on this to show you, are not doing what the early church were doing. They're actually doing the contrary to the early church. They're even doing contrary to what Christ said. There's good people in there, decent people, there, but there are people that are led astray by false gospel. And, of course, that was all prophesied. You know that was all prophesied. The question is, what you don't know is whether you're on the wrong side of that prophecy. So anyway, one of the first items that is in this Section 13 is it allows for non-vaccinated and partially vaccinated access to virtual online public schools. However, the catch is that there is a capacity load that doesn't even cover half of the students this legislation will prohibit from school. These students will be restricted greatly in their interaction with others. Well, what does that mean, Interna interaction with others? They can't go to school. If you don't get the, of all the vaccines up to date according to the statutory uh, schedules, you're not going to be able to go to school, enter a school building, 
uh, you're you're not going to be able to uh, go to uh, let's let's take a look at some of these things. Uh, I've got the numbers here. Let's see. Not only will non-vaccinated or partially vaccinated students be prohibited from enrolling in public, private, or charter schools, it will prohibit them from physically stepping foot on any public or private property that holds a school activity or children's activity. Uh, I mean, you literally could be thrown out of restaurants. (laughs) Now, how will they know that you aren't fully vaccinated? Well, the things that they're coming up with is uh, the idea that you, you're not going to get ID, you may not get driver's license, you may not get, you can't work in hospitals because that's a, that's a public place. Uh, you may not even be allowed in hospitals eventually <laughs> if you don't have all your vaccinations. I mean, they do that now for workers. So, you know, where this ends, and the, the, the big thing that we talked about last week in one of the preliminary votes and we had a guest on that was actually one of the voters. It was 9 to 30. 9 to 30 with one abstination. There was uh, 40 people there in the committee all together. 30 people were for forcing everybody to get vaccinated completely up to date. Now, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about vulnerability because we know there are adverse reactions that are right there on the uh, the sheets for vaccinations, that all kinds of bad things can happen. doesn't happen to everybody, but there is more and more evidence as to who would be vulnerable. Uh, are your children one of those vulnerable ones? There's actually things to look for that will tell you whether or not your children might be more vulnerable than the average child. Most vaccine, vaccine injuries are go undetected. You never know that your child was vaccine injured. It's only the extreme cases where you see, I mean, like death. I mean, obviously, if you get a shot and 48 hours later your children die, that's probably a vaccine injury. Most of those vaccine injuries, which amount to billions and billions of dollars in settlements to the government, not through the vaccine companies because they're immune. That's one of the things. They made sure they were immune to being sued. (laughs) And, uh, uh, you know, I chuckle at this, but I, I, I laugh in the face of evil. Because God is on my side, you know I'm not I'm not I'm not afraid of the evil. I know the evil is dangerous, but I know Christ is is really the answer. And if you would get Christ, the real Christ, on your side, not the imaginary delusional Christ that a lot of people look to, then you might be saved too. Because that's what He says. He came that you might be saved. But you got to get Christ on your side, and the way to do that is to get on the side of Christ, and the way to do that is to get on the side of righteousness. But anyway, so uh, children's uh, facilities or facilities means certified child care. Can't get child care anymore. Facilities, as described in ORS 329A.030, and I can go out and give you a bunch of other numbers, except as exempt by rules of Oregon Health Authority. In other words, I mean, there's a lot of places you're not going to be able to take your kids anymore. So it's, you know, certified child care facilities, uh, schools or post-secondary institutions uh, where care is provided to children uh, six weeks of age and over. So this is an ongoing thing. It, It goes all the way up to universities. Your kids won't be let into universities. If if you're eventually, you know, if there was any kind of an outbreak, which there will be an outbreak under mandatory vaccinations, and we'll show you why there will be an outbreak of diseases under mandatory vaccinations. I mean, right now it's it's well documented. It's not a secret. You can actually find this out in the news. You probably won't hear it even, you know, on Fox News or any of these, uh, certainly not on CNN, but there, there's been an outbreak of polio in Syria and an outbreak of polio in the Congo. And this goes on worldwide. The interesting thing is that polio outbreaks that we're talking about, where children are being crippled, you know, they're even dying, the the strain of polio that is the outbreak is all coming from the vaccinations. 
uh, I used to think that the oral vaccinations weren't as dangerous, and evidently now the statistics are showing that the oral vaccination, the, the one of the problems with uh, the uh, intermuscular vaccinations, you know, the shots uh, for polio, is that they only give you localized immunity, immunity in your body, and that's an actual gut uh, bacteria that gets into your body. Uh, most people will get more into the immunity. I mean, they're their whole sections of population that are completely immune, lifetime immunity, to every single strain uh, known to man of polio. They're just automatically immune. But you go to other parts of the world, and they're not immune. And you bring that polio virus into their midst, and you endanger them because they're not immune yet. They'll get immune if they survive the first onset of the disease, but... Some people don't have very strong immune systems because they've lived very isolated lives, which is why one of the contributing factors, and we'll look at that too, that, you know, like whole villages of Inuit died out from polio. Uh, there were a lot of other extenuating circumstances, but they, the Inuits had lived isolated lives for centuries, and their immune system was not as strong as it needed to be. And when you introduce these new diseases, they're their body is unfamiliar with that it takes sometimes a tremendous toll and so but the reality is polio is all around you uh it's you know in the united states you know during the polio epidemics it was around everywhere 95 to 98 percent of the people in the united states during these polio outbreaks that were exposed to polio which was a lot developed lifetime immunity and never knew that they were even exposed because it was totally asymptomatic. There, there were no symptoms. They saw no symptoms whatsoever, 95 to 98 percent. By the time the vaccine came out, most of the people who received the vaccine were already immune. They just didn't know it. Nobody tested to see if they were immune or not. And that's, that was actually why polio had gone down so much. But again, we'll look at more at that. But now they're Everybody's still afraid of things like polio and all this stuff. Most people are immune to polio without the vaccination. Most people were immune to polio before the vaccination even came out. The number of cases had dwindled and dwindled and dwindled and had gone way down for a variety of reasons. Uh, you had really already reached herd immunity before the vaccine even came out. But everybody wants to attribute the, you know, the... Uh, in the polio to the vaccine when the reality is that there isn't a correlation because we see clearly that the vaccine had already, uh, I mean, the, the threat of polio had already diminished to almost nothing. There was actually in 1961, there was a rise in polio cases. And this was after the vaccine. But I can show you in congressional records, testimony of Salk himself uh, that says that that rise in polio in 1961 was almost entirely from the vaccine itself, which was given. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. 100 percent sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, 
we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. to some of the places that you will be excluded and your children will be excluded and it's almost any place that people gather you, you know you, places where you are allowed to peaceably assemble uh, this can actually even affect and it's mentioned churches your, your child may not be physically go may not physically go into any property of a church as uh, also contains a licensed daycare or preached uh, or preschool or private school. Uh, where are other pa places that people gather? Well, airports. Uh, will you have to have a vaccine certification, not just for children, but for adults? Because most vaccine immunity, or many, uh, yeah, I'd say most vaccine immunities are, are maybe only seven to ten years. Uh, some don't even last that long and require boosters, sometimes annual boosters. This is for every man, woman, and child in the United States eventually if this goes into the U.S. legislature. And you think it won't happen? Well, it's happening. Now, Washington had this. It was voted in Congress in Washington, but it was recently just voted down by the Senate. But we're talking not very high margins, you know, uh, in these committees. If you have... Uh, 30 people voting to create this mandatory vaccination system and only nine voting against it, that's not a good sign. You know, I, I mentioned that to somebody just the other day and pointed out, and they they gave me that deer-in-the-headlights look again where they like, wow, <laughs> that's amazing because your minds are being taken over by ideas that are really not compatible with Christ. And... And what we're seeing here in this attempt to force everybody, you won't be able to get on airplanes eventually. You won't be able to get on buses eventually. You won't be able to take public transportation. You may not be able to walk down the street. That, that, for those students who do enroll in online school, which the public will only give you, you know, a little bit of access, a very limited access to because of the fact that they only have facilities for so many so you homeschoolers are going to have to start coming together and creating online schools where your kids can be at home and isolate because this is what they're, they're they actually state this can sit at home in isolated uh, in isolation but they cannot participate in any face to face gathering with classmates including field trips etc so field trips, what, you can't get on buses, you can't get on planes, you can't gather in public places, will you be allowed in the mall, will you be allowed in the grocery stores? It can happen where they can exclude you from all these places. You're going to have to show ID and you can't get the ID without the vaccination. These things have been proposed. I'm not just reading this from some script of some, you know, uh, science fiction movie. These are what is being proposed all across the United States and even going to be uh, brought up now because the bills are already written. They were already written before the measles outbreak. Another thing, there was a measles outbreak in Washington. Forty-nine uh, cases uh, were reported, and so they were f afraid that they were going to start showing up 
in Oregon. And so the news came out that there were like four cases already, and and they were mentioning certain places where people might have been exposed. And, and so a doctor had somebody come into his office that had some of the symptoms of measles, so they were going to take a culture and send it into the health department to have it tested. Uh, this is a well-known doctor, and he was going to have it tested to see if this is a measles case. And they said, don't send it. They said there has been no verified cases of measles in Oregon. This is, you know, the, the, this is, it was completely hyped up by the media. Why? Why are these things hyped up by the media? Because people have an agenda and they have public relations people that want to get these passed. This is going to be billions of dollars in value to pharmaceutical companies if they they create this mandatory vaccination. So what are the uh, other repercussions besides your tax dollar your tax dollars at work? Governor Brown has, you know, this was not to go into effect according to the bill the way it was set up till August 1st, 2020. That's when it would uh, uh currently be enrolled students uh would be affected by August 1st, 2020. But Governor Brown has stated that she will push this through as an emergency, so there's her state of emergency, and apply it uh, July 1st, 2019. So that's not so far away. <laughs> that's just months away. So if you if you want to avoid this, you need to get all of your legislatures right away and stop them from passing it, at least temporarily. But this is this is what's happening. So. Uh, the the wording in the bill will allow for that, and she has stated that she w- uh, is intending to do just that. So all these restrictions could fall upon you rather quickly, and uh, like I say, there's even evidence that they're putting this uh, together uh, in other places. Now, uh, a doctor actually here in Oregon has done a personal study amongst his. He didn't do the study. He hired an independent firm to look at the facts. He happens to have a number of people that come to his clinic. He vaccinates all the time, but he has a number of uh, people that come to his clinic that do not get any vaccinations. And uh, about 715 uh, are non-vaccinated people at all. So, you know, I could ask you, what, what are the statistics concerning autism? Now, everybody will say, oh, autism, vaccines don't cause autism. Well, why? Do you have any proof of that? No, you actually don't, and nobody else does either. We know that in 1970, that one in 10,000 children would get autism. Well, that's not very many. One in 10,000, that's hardly anybody. In 1975, one in 5,000 would get autism. 1985, one in 2,500 would get autism. By 1995, one in 500 would get autism. Well, that's that's getting to be a lot of people, one in 500. Well, by 1913, or excuse me, 2013, uh, one in 50 get autism. That's plague proportions. That's, uh, you know, polio, only one, you know, well, actually, maybe two or three people out of 100 people exposed to polio virus would show any symptoms whatsoever we're not even talking paralysis we're just talking about a fever uh, sore throat maybe uh, some diarrhea you know it looked like a cold Uh, and we're talking just a few percentage one uh, two three people in a hundred and then it was only a small fraction of those people that would experience any kind of paralysis and much of that paralysis would be overcome within the first six months or a year so it's actually the statistics of autism are far outweigh the statistics that we were seeing with polio. It's far more uh, children are getting autism today. That It's a plague. And it happens. To, and so what is causing the plague? Well, of those 715 children that had no vaccinations whatsoever, although we're constantly being uh, uh in contact with kids who did get vaccinations, and we know that a lot of children who get vaccinations now, just like I said, in the Congo and and places like Syria, 
are actually spreading disease that causes the high fever, that can cause the brain damage, that can cause autism. I mean, it's not just the chemicals that might be in vaccinations, but it can just be fevers. That's why way back in the 70s you could get 1 in 10,000 that would get autism. Uh, It's actually believed by a number of uh, researchers that FDR never had polio. He had high fevers, he got real sick, and he got polio symptoms, but they, they're they not sure that he ever got polio. And you'd probably have to dig him up in order to find out. But uh, uh, but he could have been exposed to polio later on and had polio and never showed any symptoms. Just because, you know, I could show you on Egyptian tombs, guys who have symptoms, uh, you know, where they draw the people on the tomb. They they're, have a crutch, and they, their leg looks like a classic polio case. Polio's been around for a long, long time. But when we had large numbers of population moving about, uh, people would be exposed to strains they weren't familiar with. But it's very clear that many of these diseases, from influenza to polio, polio is a waterborne disease usually, uh, were getting... Uh, exposed because of the fact that people were moving around, you know, like you you bring immigrants from a country that has one set of diseases, they can bring those diseases into your country, which was the whole reason why Ellis Island was uh, created, was to look for certain elements of tuberculosis and some of the other contagious diseases that you would turn people back because they were, it was for the greater good. It was endangering people by bringing these diseases into your country. And I can see that to some degree. I don't really think that's the solution. The solution is to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But people have a right to protect them. So that's why you get to have a front door on your house. You get to lock the door so that dangerous people are not coming in and going without your say-so, whether it's sickness or they're carrying guns or what have you. Uh, So anyway... I could tell you stories about that. Uh, but so, you know, that was back in 2013, 1 in 50. Of these people that were had received no vaccination, there was only one case of autism. You know, so that that's that's a huge that's a huge difference that that you had this one in uh, I was going to look for the actual uh, one in 715 among non-vaccinated. He had another group that were partially vaccinated. They didn't receive all the vaccinations uh, because some really are, you know, hepatitis B. Why in the world is your infant child getting hepatitis B? Hepatitis B, you get that from dirty needles and sexual intercourse with people that are infected. I mean, you you don't get it because somebody sneezed on the bus. Uh, So why in the world is your infant child getting hepatitis B if you are you don't have the disease. You can test to see whether or not you have the hepatitis B in you. If you don't have it, where are they going to get it? <laughs> it's not likely they'll get it at all. And you're you're pumping them. You know, in, in that vaccine alone, there is five times the aluminum that is allowed for an adult. I mean, there's like 250, what is it, micrograms? or Yeah, micrograms, I think it is in that vaccine and an adult should only receive 50 and so why are you giving that vaccine so there's a lot of vaccines you don't need but according to this bill you have to have everything up to the schedule that they say and that schedule can be constantly changing and like I I just said and I could show you countless studies that vaccines being vaccinated can cause you to slough, to not only get the uh, the disease as we're seeing in, in many countries, uh, it can you will shed that virus, and other people around you will become exposed to that virus that would not have been exposed before. Uh, herd immunity has to do with just like 60% of the people in your community, if they have natural immunity especially natural immunity as opposed to vaccine immunity, you're, you're, you really have herd immunity already, just 60%. Uh, 
they have 90% vaccination rates now for many diseases, and yet they say, oh, well, no, we need even more in order to attain herd immunity. Well, the reason why is because vaccines don't work for everybody, and they they aren't going to give you herd immunity because some of some of the vaccines only have like five to uh, to ten percent effectiveness. Some vaccines, some have higher degrees, but none of them claim one hundred percent effectiveness. And because we're not all the same, and this is why some children are more vulnerable than other children. Like I said, we'll get into some of the things to look for to find out if your child is more vulnerable. But, you know, if you're seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you have to care about the next child as much as you care about your own. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that the way we do that is we get mandatory vaccinations because they think vaccinations are their salvation. And the statistics and the studies and the evidence show that, no, it's not. And we're going to look at some of them. I want to quote them. And we've already put some of them up on our page at Preparing You on Vaccines, and we'll probably put more. There have been a number of people putting together some information. I put a, a lot of stuff there, but other people have been putting stuff there. And uh, and you can check these out. You know, I'm putting in the footnotes so you can go look at where did he get that from, you know. And we're talking, we're quoting peer-reviewed papers. We have uh, links to a lot of other people who talk about this. I mean, like Susan Humphreys, uh, she talks a lot about this. She's a doctor. She's really a researcher. She's a very bright woman. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if you listen to her uh, interviews and her lectures, she go, it may go over the head of a lot of people. So we've tried to put, you know, this stuff together so you can just look at it without getting too scientific. But we have stuff in the footnotes so you can go look it up. Uh, when... This uh, polymyelitis uh, or poliomyelitis that uh, came out uh, was causing problems. There was a lot of different things that went on. You know, polio was virtually unknown before the end of the 19th century, although the disease was uh, first noted in 1789. Only isolated cases surfaced until the first epidemic struck a village in France in 1885. From then on, polio gathered strength. Uh, There were epidemics in North America in 1890, in Scandinavia in 1900s, in the UK, in Africa, Australia. It didn't mention Brazil anywhere. (laughs) Why? Because they had polio in Brazil, all strains of polio, and all the natives were already immune. They had polio around them all the time. They didn't get sick. They had true herd immunity. You know, and again, you know, why in the Brazilian rainforest would you have that? Well, it's, again, waterborne. Uh, all kinds of – they didn't know what that was causing it originally when these outbreaks were taking place, and there were all kinds of outlandish uh, – claims and causes of it, including cats. You know, and they, they actually like 70,000 cats were, some people say, massacred, well, put to death uh, in 1916 during a panic in New York because somebody said that it's the cats that carry it because, you know, like bubonic plague, it was the rats and fleet, but it ended up being the fleas. Some people said it was blueberries. <laughs> some people said it was milk. Um, now, the one author says that some people blamed uh, Italian immigrants and even sugar. Sugar was never considered a cause of polio. What it was suggested that large amounts of white processed sugar in the form of ice cream might affect your immune system so that you could not easily become immune, which most people were easily becoming immune to polio. Like I said, 95 to 98 percent of the people who got polio got over polio, got a lifetime immunity, and never showed any symptoms whatsoever. They never even knew they were sick. But it is you. I can show you in a microscope. You put uh, blood in a microscope with live blood cells, red blood cells, uh, white blood cells, and other agents in it that the white blood cells would be attacking. 
And you can watch the white blood cells actually surround those particles and destroy them, break them down, digest them, and consume them. And that's what makes you safe. Because then with cellular communication, your body will develop a natural immunity to these foreign antigens. I can give the same person sugar, take a blood sample a few minutes later, and you will watch those white blood cells walk around like a drunken man at a party. They will not be paying attention to business. And that's just that's just biology. You know, sugar can have that effect on your immune system temporarily. Eventually the sugar will wear off and uh, the white blood cell will get back to business again. It won't be drunk anymore. But the reality is during that period of time, the polio may be reproducing in your cells. And, uh, and it gets a head start. They actually, they actually have statistics where, you know, when they came out with the suggestion that people, uh, people con- uh, consuming large amounts of uh, ice cream, uh, I'm not saying it's extremely large amount. Ice cream was really popular during the summer, during the most vulnerable time when people are going swimming. They go down to the rivers, they go swimming, and they have some ice cream, and they don't know it, but they've ingested polio, and their body should be fighting that polio. Instead, all their white blood cells are drunk on the sugar that they ate. They probably had a soda pop or, or something along with the sugar, you know, or maybe cotton candy was getting popular back then. Who knows? But they their sugar intake, uh, intake rose during a time when it was probably not a good idea to raise that sugar intake. And Lo and behold, they ended up with polio. When the scare came out that sugar was connected to this, ice cream sales plummeted in New York for a year, whole summer. I mean, the ice cream men couldn't give their ice cream away. Oh, no, we don't want any of that because of the polio scare. Because it just swept through the people because of this article that came out suggesting that there might be some sort of correlation to the... Everybody was getting polio anyway, but they were getting over it without any symptoms. Because the polio, the sugar had nothing to do with the polio in the water or the polio connection to, to other people. But polio levels of cases dropped. There's probably the same amount of people exposed, but the symptoms dropped because nothing was compromising or very little was compromising their immune system. Immediately... Ice cream people came out with articles poo-pooing this and saying this was terrible, and by the ne- and they really started a campaign by the next summer, and and the sales of ice cream went back up again, and guess what? The cases of polio went back up again <laughs> because now you were seeing this effect. Now, is that proven? Well, it is proven under a microscope that high doses, like eating a big ice cream cone of sugar. And then look at your own personal white blood cells will be affected by that. Now, different people will be affected differently because different people's pancreas works differently. And maybe it will keep that sugar level down in your system. Uh, But the fact that you get diabetes, that's going to affect your immune system uh, because of the fact it affects your blood sugar. Blood sugar is a... The levels of blood sugar have a tremendous effect on your immune system. So that wasn't necessarily, you know, they say sale of ice cream plummeted during the the sugar scare. Well, yeah, and so did the cases of polio. (laughs) So, so, So there is a correlation, but correlation is not causation. But like I say, you look at if your white blood cells aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, that's causation for polio. It wasn't causing polio but it was allowing the polio to grow in your body to reproduce. Viruses don't reproduce. That's one of the things. Viruses don't reproduce. They have no reproductive organ in a virus. It's a very simplistic little chain of molecules. Uh, it uses your system to reproduce. And that's actually that principle is played out in your thinking. When everybody is thinking a particular way, it's going to affect most of the people around them that think in a particular way. So it's very important. The more people that wake up need to come together because 
in that coming together and acting upon what you're beginning to see and reveal, be revealed to you spiritually, mentally. God is writing upon your heart and your mind. You need to implement that by coming together and doing what Christ is saying. And that's what the early church was doing. They were coming together, practicing pure religion. That's going to lead to you waking up more and seeing more things. You know, like measles. People worry about measles, you know, it's deadly and all this kind of stuff. Well, it was deadly at times. You know, most people recovered from it. Uh, But one of the things that will help you recover from measles is something as simple as vitamin A, cod liver oil, uh, and lots of other sources of vitamin A in your diet, especially during the time where you get measles. And it will help you recover more quickly. Uh, Vitamin C can help you recover from almost everything uh, because it's, uh, you know, it has this, uh, oxygen is very important to everything. So these oxidants that they call them, uh, is it's all part of your immune system. And you get, there are lots and lots of things, good diet, uh, cleaning, covering your mouth when you cough, all these things, you know, uh, people weren't allowed on trams who didn't have masks during some of these, like the Spanish flu epidemic. Well, look at the Spanish flu. What vaccine cured Spanish flu? Does anybody know? Because the Spanish flu came, killed more people than the Black Plague. What what vaccine eradicated Spanish flu? Answer, none. They never made one. (laughs) But Spanish flu came and went. What happened? Everybody got immune. Why did so many people die? compromised immune systems. Uh, actually, a lot of people died from Spanish flu. It's, it's not the thing. There's lots of different factors to this. You know, poor diet, poor hygiene, crowding a uh, large number of people that are s- severely sick together in hospitals where doctors weren't even really washing their hands. This is back at, during World War One, And uh, anyway, uh, all, all these, but one of the big contributing factors, and there's there's articles written about this, and they demonstrated was that bare aspirin's patent on aspirin had run out. I think it was in 1914. Maybe wrong about that date, but it's close to that period. And so all kinds of businesses could now make aspirin, not just bare. And they started promoting aspirin as something that would help you with flu when that's absolutely the reverse. And they were actually giving people what might be considered almost lethal doses for some people. They were giving aspirin to people because of this, and it was causing pneumonia. And people were actually not dying of the flu, but dying of the pneumonia. It was counted as the flu, but it was actually the pneumonia caused by excessive doses of aspirin during a time when they're immune. The book of Revelation says... The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. 